welcome to digital media i forgot the number of the course so it, it's just going to be what it is digital media 301 r the uh audio industry uh somebody pipe in here what do we call this thing audio industry lecture brian, live stream with brian live stream with brian uh where <laughs> we have mistakes and we just roll with it because that's what we do today we're here with joey bradford um joey i've known for a while um because joey has some connections here to utah uh has some connections through a lot of his work to other people that um i know as well so joey let's just jump right in and this is the like most simple dumb basic question but it's actually a very complicated question for you what do you do for a living well, the my main role in life at this point is uh, I play guitar for the youth, um, and I've been in the band now for about six years. I jumped in the last couple albums, um, and on top of that, I also produce records. I co-write with a lot of different artists. Um, I manage seven bands and artists. I have graphic designers and content creators on my roster. Um, I run a studio out of uh, on my property in Vista, California, which is San Diego. And I mean, that's kind of the short of it. Oh, and I have a couple kids and a wife. So that's probably the most important thing. Right. You've got, but, you've got, you've got the full life going on. So I got a lot of shit. I got a lot of stuff going on. And that's, you know what, um, that's a good thing. That means, I think that will show these guys that doing all these things is possible and that i think the whole purpose of this class is to demystify things that people perceive about the audio industry that like we've you and i have been able to overcome but as you're coming up in it you're like oh there's no way i'm going to ever be able to be successful in this industry because it's too cutthroat or whatever um sure. what's your favorite part about what you do um, I, man, touring, touring and playing live shows is, is, you know, unmatched. I don't think that that's something that you can recreate in any other part of life. I think it's, you know, I've been very blessed to be able to play live music since I was a kid and do that pretty consistently. Um, but aside from the obvious, you know, playing sold out shows is every kid's dream, but, um, but producing songs and, and co-writing with other artists and, um, I really love working with an artist that has an idea that they just can't get out and, and trying to push that creativity and get it to something that the rest of the world can connect with and relate with. And um, I think that's probably my favorite part is, is writing songs and creating feelings and emotions with music, which is seemingly not a real job, you know? So I, I really enjoy that side of things. On the flip side of that, what are some of the things that you like the least? Oh, wow. Um, from a management side, you know, dealing with a lot, a lot of different artists and personalities, um, which I actually, I don't mind that side of it, but, but dealing with record labels and dealing with publishing companies and, you know, all of kind of the day-to-day nine to five suit style things that are inevitably um, necessary to run a business. I don't love doing that, but I recognize that, um, it's something that I, that I'm not terrible at. You know, I worked with a lot of people that helped me out from the management side and, and worked with a lot of different suits over the years that really just didn't get it. So, um, I try to make the things that I don't like turn into something where everyone can enjoy and we can still get to the end result that we need for the business to continue. So I really don't love having to, you know, get 14 emails from a label that are not communicating with each other, all saying the same thing, but that's the role. And you try to get through it so you can put out beautiful art that people can connect with. Yeah. Um, I I know your path pretty well because I've known you for a bunch of years and I know we have mm. a lot of very uh, close common friends, but um Students and people out there that might be watching this don't know your path to get to the point where you're at now. Will you kind of backtrack over your life and tell us how you ended up where you're at now? Yeah, I'll do my best. It's kind of uh, it's just a million twists and turns, you know. So 
Um, ultimately, I started playing music. I got into music when I was in middle school, as a lot of us did. Um, I had some friends that had a guitar and and a buddy of mine who uh, showed me how to play a couple Blink-182 songs because he wanted someone to jam with. And um, yeah, from there, once I once I got into high school, uh, my very first day of high school, I met two of my best friends to this day. And uh, we started a band and it was like, let's figure out how to play some other people's music and start writing songs and um, got into that. And then the singer of that band, uh, he was a year older than me, but his senior year of high school, he ended up joining um, a big touring band. I guess I can just use names. So okay. Cove. Cove Reber is one of my best friends. We had a band together and then senior year of high school, he ended up joining Seosin. Um, and then our other best friend, Bill Scrosso, he joined Azalea Dying the same year. So two of my really good friends kind of jumped into already established businesses and bands. And that was really when it opened up uh, the reality of this world um, as previously thinking that it's not something that's in the cards for any of us, you know, it's such a, a battlefield, but, um, they joined those bands. And then right when I graduated high school, um, I jumped on the road with Seosin and I was their merch guy. So I sold t-shirts for about five years. And during that time, I bounced around a bunch of different bands. I worked for Seosin, I worked for Dredge, uh, I worked for Thrice for quite a while, um, a band called Delta Spirit. But I kind of just did anything I could do to stay on the road and stay around, you know, the touring industry and make a couple bucks and sell some gear when I got home to pay rent and all of that stuff. And I think along that journey is when I started to get calls to fill in for other artists. So I got to play uh, played guitar for Thrice for a few weeks of a tour. Um, I played for a band called Static Lullaby for a reunion tour, filled in for a Treyu for about a year. Um, just kind of anything and everything. I was definitely a weasel, so to speak. I was never scared to cross a line or I was never scared to be told no. And I always just kind of like elbowed my way into a situation that would, you know, be the next stepping stone. Um, and then through that, I ended up joining a band called Hell or High Water with Brandon, who was in Atreyu. And we made a few records together and we toured the world and did a bunch of cool stuff. And when that kind of chapter started to close I jumped into guitar teching world and I guitar teched for Atreyu and then I jumped into Good Charlotte I worked with Good Charlotte for a couple of years and then after that I um, had heard through the grapevine that the used may be looking for a guitar player and crossed a whole bunch of lines I probably shouldn't have crossed to to get an opportunity and really it really feels like luck you know I think um my history in the industry. And I knew a lot of these guys vaguely helped. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm not some insane guitar player or some insane musician, you know, I think I had the prerequisites down, but ultimately it just came from the relationships that I was able to make through the years. And that opportunity happened to bear fruit. And here I am, we're about six years into that. Now I've done two albums with the band. Uh, our single is currently number 23 on alt radio and climbing, which is fun. And then right when I joined what's the that, band, what's that single right now? Uh, it's called giving up. It's on our new record, toxic positivity. My favorite one I think is called pinky promise on that record. Pinky swear. Yeah. Pinky yeah, yeah. And funny enough, we wrote that with, with Brandon Saller, who was in hell or high water and I tray you. And um, one of my writing partners that I've had forever. Um, that's another thing that I've done with him through the years too, is I've done a lot of sync writing where we'll just write uh, music for TV and, and film and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so we did that. And then right when I joined the use is when Cove was starting his new band called Dead American. And they had asked me to manage them. And I jumped into the management world, having no idea what I was doing. Just I knew what I didn't like from my previous, you know, relationships. And things just kind of snowballed. And now I have seven bands that I manage and a whole bunch of content creators and um, music video directors. And we kind of just have a big old team of people that we all work together. And uh, ultimately you learn that this industry is a bunch of people like me that just didn't go away. And we're calling our friends that we used to sell t-shirts next to on warp tour in the early two thousands. And they're all running labels and publishing companies and producers and all that stuff now. So, um, I've been very blessed and everything has kind of bounced from one thing to the next. 
uh, you know, I said yes to everything that ever kind of came across my desk and, um, and here we are. I, I still have extreme imposter syndrome. None of it seems real, but I'm fortunate enough to get to do all of the stuff I wanted to do and able to take care of the family and bring them out on tour when it makes sense. And yeah, it's fun. Yeah. You, uh, you touched on a lot of bands that you've been in and a lot of those bands have very different sounds than the other bands that you were in. Oh yeah. You, you, you say you're not a great guitarist, but I think a great guitarist can jump in and just pick up and play anything uh, for <laughs> anyone and just go right to whatever, whatever it is that you've got to do. And so I think that you're not giving yourself enough credit for being able to be <laughs> a, a really good hybrid. And you, I mean, one of the things that I've always really enjoyed about you is you're really keen on creating sonic signatures within your guitar tones that like that aren't just the standard right you you sure, like yeah boundaries and stuff um and and creating sonic signature that that's your own who are some people that like have helped shape your sounds your influence your uh Ooh. your your creativity oh man i'm always generally terrible at answering this question um there was a lot of people uh, kind of around my town when I was growing up that were really, really on top of that and had different cool amps and different, you know, styles. And uh, I think a lot of the different genres that I bounced in and out of kind of helped you know, mold what I wanted to have out of my sounds and my guitars. Um, but man, people who influenced me like bigger musicians, that's such a tough call. You know, as I'm saying, I play in the used and played with the Treyu and all these like heavy leaning bands. I think, um, you know, someone like Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead is someone who I've always been obsessed with. Um, Quinn, who was the original guitar player for the used, I was a massive fan of his growing up. Um, and I kind of kind of took little bits and pieces from everyone I watched, you know, like I remember seeing. Uh, the used when I was a kid and standing front row at the show so that I could see what pedals Quinn had and what he was using. And I remember getting a DL4 from line six when I was uh, like 14 years old and, you know, learning about delay and then uh, getting a EVH 5150 head a couple years later and learning about, you know, really glassy sounding clean tones and, and really heavy sounding distorted amps without breaking it up and having feedback and fuzz and, um, yeah. And then I had to deal with orange for a while. So I got to get into like the British tone side of things and uh, a buddy of mine collected Fender twins for a while. And I got to try the different, you know, silver faces and blue faces and all these different amps. And um, ultimately I think I lean towards a, a bit rounder and heavier modern sounding guitar tone. Um, and then I like to, you know, have four or five different tones that I choose from for any different project. So I'm always way, way overkill with what I build for my live rigs and most of whatever I build into it, I don't end up actually using, but, um, but in the studio, I mean, I have, you know, I have six or seven amps that are always hooked up into my studio and then we have loads of plugins that are incredible and, um, yeah, I've never been one to be like, I'm searching for a silver face Fender twin with, you know, 10% gain to sound like this specific thing. I've always just been a noodler and mess with knobs until it feels right. You know, I've always kind of trusted my ears rather than my eyes, um, which I feel like has, has been a blessing. It's been something where I have never been so oversaturated with knowledge on what something is supposed to be or sound like. And I've always just kind of noodled until it feels like the right thing to accompany the vocals ultimately. Right. You've, uh, you've been able to work with some really incredible engineers over the years as well. Uh, a lot of the students that you're talking to right now specifically are going into audio engineering. Um, there's something that happens from the amplifier to the microphone back into the control room that changes the sound and how do you keep your integrity of sound and what are some of the things that you've learned over the years to keep that integrity of sound into the control room yeah i mean um i've learned a lot about the room that the the amp is in i mean that has been a, a an eternal battle right like going from complete isolation and iso cabs and you know running 
DIs after a head and before a cab and splitting signals and, and doing all these different things. And, um, ultimately I've, I've, my takeaway is, you know, there, there is no very specific answer as we've all searched on YouTube to find that exact answer. It doesn't exist. You know, I think, uh, the vibe of a song always kind of dictates where we end up placing mics or what kind of isolation I'm going to use, or if I'm going to use, uh, an amp emulator, or if I'm going to use something that's more analog and get more of a room feel. Um, but I really don't have, I don't have like a standard set up when I run guitars, you know, I'll try different mics. Sometimes it's, you know, a ribbon mic, if we're going to do something with a little bit of breakup on a vintage amp, or, uh, you know, sometimes I just throw a 57 on a big, you know, four by 10 cab or four by 12 cab, whatever it is, uh, vintage thirties, greenbacks, you know, we're going to run 50 Watts instead of a hundred. Like I, I really just, as we're going, we're twisting knobs, flipping switches, moving mics until it's like, all right, that's the one, you know, like, um, but I will say, I will admit to you that, uh, in the last handful of years, I've been very, very DI and plug-in heavy, especially with guitars. I think it just gives so much freedom to get the song recorded and written as fast as possible and then really go back and make those decisions after the vocals are done. Um, that was a huge lesson that took me a lot, a lot of years to learn is no matter how sonically incredible something sounds on its own or even instrumental, uh, you know, if the vocals or the lyrics, the melody, the actual song isn't there, then it doesn't matter how good it sounds. And if those things are there, it doesn't matter how bad it sounds. So um, that was a huge confidence builder for me as a producer. Once I learned like, hey, the lyrics come first, the melody comes first. And once you're there, then you can dive into the wonderland of making something sound really special for all of us nerds that want to pay attention to that, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um going from the studio to the stage is also another huge jump and you're dealing with a completely different working architect uh, right. architecture for your sound. Um, some people want that exact sound from uh, studio to stage. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I am absolutely not that. I think, uh, you know, when you're making a record, sometimes you want to have, uh, you know, fake drums that sound lo-fi that's going to create this incredible alternative sounding song. And and sometimes it's, you know, a clean guitar throughout an entire song and, and that makes it work on record. But when you transfer that into a live scenario playing amphitheaters, you know, like maybe having the lo-fi digital drum and the, the super crystal clear guitar doesn't really suit the 20,000 people with energy. So... Um, my live setup has always been unique, completely unique to whatever we're doing on a record. Um, you know, I will, I will definitely use certain effects on guitars and things like that to um, get the point across, but I'm definitely beefing up the gain. I'm definitely beefing up everything that I can from a live perspective. And a lot of times we even change parts to make the songs, you know, feel like a rock jam. You know, with with alternative bands and indie bands and some of the, some of those genres, I think, you know, getting as close to the record as you can is a cool thing. But for me, I think it's just such a completely different experience. And, you know, providing people with that feeling when they come to see it live doesn't necessarily mean that they want to hear the same clean flanged out whatever on a verse. Sometimes you want distortion and some delay or um, something to really just bring those feelings up. Um, and same thing goes with with drums and bass and and even the way that we produce vocals live. You know, a lot of times we're building a, a really aggressive rock show, even if the songs aren't necessarily aggressive rock songs. Yeah, that's a that's really good feedback and input. Um, you you've had some really cool gigs. You've had some really cool uh, time. But what are some things in like the school of hard knocks that you've learned that you mm -hmm. share with us that would help other people avoid pitfalls as they come up in their careers? Sure. Yeah. Um, man, I think I put a lot of stock. I kind of touched on this a little bit ago, but when I was coming up, I put so much stock in, um, in instrumental and, and the sonic side of writing music. 
Uh, and it took me a really, really long time and a lot of failed songs that I thought were incredible that didn't, you know, meet the checkpoints that were expected of it or whatever, further the career. Um, and it ultimately just came down to learning that that writing a song means that you're writing words and a melody and something that can connect with people. And that doesn't always come by starting by writing an instrumental and then trying to make vocals fit on top of some cool guitar shit that you did or some cool drum beat or things that that ultimately just don't matter. Like that was a really hard pill for me to swallow. And it's something that I learned from, you know, working with producers that have platinum records all over their walls who can barely play the guitar, who can barely sing, but they they know what a good melody is. They almost have a superpower at not being great at their instrument because they're playing three power chords and that's what you're writing a song to. Um, I think that was probably the, the most important lesson that I've learned from producing, engineering, songwriting, doing all of these things that ultimately, if you don't have vocals and melodies that you can play with an acoustic guitar or on a piano, then the song is probably not there, you know? Um, that's not to say that you can't write an instrumental and make a great song after the fact. There's no rules there. There really isn't. That's a big, big lesson too, is doesn't matter what you start with. Doesn't matter how you make the song. If at the end of it, if it's great vocals, then whatever it takes to get there. Um, but I think I focus so much on, you know, I'm going to spend a whole day making sure the snare sounds sick or like, you know, I'm going to try 20 different amps until this guitar is perfect, but you don't have a, a vocal that's catchy there yet, you know, so it doesn't matter. And that's why bands like, um, you know, the White Stripes, we'll use them as an example. Like now, looking back now to us, it's like sonically super cool. But when it came out, it was like, what the heck is going on? But the songs were so catchy, it didn't matter. And they're still playing on the radio today. Um, and I guarantee that those songs were written with one guitar and they wrote vocals and then they went and produced a song around it to make it work. So um, that was a big one. And then, you know, then there's a million other sides to this conversation with touring and uh, man, the the pain that is touring and figuring out how to make it work and not lose all your money and having to have jobs at home to, to counteract all the vehicle issues you have and all that stuff. But um yeah, I don't know if that's where you want me to go. <laughs> but yeah, go go ahead and talk about it cuz you you're balancing a lot of things. Um we've had uh we've had some other people on in the series um who talked about making a living uh by staying in the same place and said it would be hard to make a living on the road and you you have a studio obviously you're working with people but do you ever take those projects from the studio with you on the road and how do you manage those if you do um i do i do from time to time um i try to do all of my all of that type of work when i'm home i like to be in my home base and it's just comfortable um but funny enough this tour that we're on right now we've had we're a weekend and every single day has been some insane hurdle that we did not expect to have to deal with uh, we're on our third bus, our third truck that broke down yesterday. We've had two different drivers for one of the buses. Um, a crew member lost a member of his family and they had to leave. Just like every single day, there's been some sort of hurdle that made it feel like the show was going to be impossible. Uh, but we've done the show every night and the shows have been incredible. And, and you know, you have these days where you wake up and most of my day is empty. We have crew that does everything. So I, you know, I go do my sound check and then I, at nine 30, I go on stage and play my show. So it's pretty easy to get in my head and kind of like think of all the things that are going wrong. But once we get on stage and play a big old sold out show, it's like really, really quickly the adrenaline and that feeling of purpose comes and you realize that it's, it is worth doing and it is playing live shows and traveling around the world to connect with people is ultimately the greatest feeling that you get out of all of this. You know, I love writing. I love the process of doing that. I love the process of recording it. But um, kind of the way that I talk about it is as soon as the album is done, I flip off producer mode and I turn on entertainer mode. And especially with a band like The Used, where, um, you know, we're, we're pretty open about some big, heavy topics with our music and our lives. And uh, it gives us an opportunity to connect with people on more than just, you know, Hey man, I like your music. It's like we we get to connect with people who's who tell us that their lives have been saved by what we've 
been willing to talk about and we get to do things like this and talk with you guys and and be as transparent as possible about how hard it is but how rewarding it is and um i wouldn't trade any of that for the world but i tell you what it is not it's not a glamorous life but uh, where you're at right now and if I, i i recognize where you're at you're in a hotel room right oh yeah how yeah. how you're not on you're not you're not in the comfort of home you're in a different strange bed every night for weeks every night yeah right? how you said you take your family with you sometimes i know your kids are a little uh yeah you know, how, do, how do they deal with the road um you know what it's a blessing and a curse so um and this is a big topic with a lot of the guys that we tour with now it's you know we're at this kind of stage three in our lives of touring we call it dads on tour at this point but um it's it's the blessing side of things is when I am home, although I do a million other jobs, but when I am home, I'm technically available 24 seven, you know, I don't have to go to a nine to five. I don't have to go to an office. I don't have to go give other people my time outside of focusing on being with my kids and my wife and working on our house and doing normal people things for big extended periods of time. Um, you know, but that being said, once I'm gone, I'm gone. Like dad's out my wife's doing homeschool with our kids right now by herself and taking them to all the different events. And, um, but it's, it's something that, you know, it it didn't sneak up on us. Like I've been, you know, my wife and I have been together for a really long time since I started doing this and she's really independent and she's way cooler than I am and has her own endeavors and, and, you know, she doesn't need me. But, uh, but they love it. You know, I've been able to, my oldest daughter is, she's almost six years old and she's just now really getting it, what dad does. And we will bring her out to shows and sometimes we'll bring her on stage and she'll dance around. And um, it's really, really special. You know, we all recognize that we live a very, very privileged life and that we are super lucky to get the opportunity to be a rock musician and support our family, which is one of those pipe dreams I had when I was a kid that I never really thought would actually come to fruition. So, um, but yeah, my wife loves it. She's super supportive. My band, all my band and all of our wives and all of our kids, we all get along really well and it's super special. So um, like this tour, we rehearsed in Nashville for a week before we started and I got to bring my family out. All of them were out for the whole week and we got to have, you know, kind of a vacation mornings and evenings and do special things that we would just, you know, never get to do if I just had a regular job at home. Um, yeah, man, I think ultimately it's a huge blessing and, and my family recognizes that, but sometimes it's really hard, you know, when I'm gone for seven, eight weeks, like that's when it really starts to get brutal, but it, this is the bed that we live in, you know, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that and for opening up about everything that, you know, I think one of the coolest aspects of the conversations that we've had in this class so far is people are really willing to open up about these hard knocks things, these things that are really not maybe construed as, Oh, that's not what I want to hear. Uh, yeah. And that's the best thing is we're not putting a, a, you know, silver lining polish on the same thing. Oh yeah. This is the coolest thing every single day. <laughs> go do this every day. I'm sure there's days you just don't even want to, you're just like, Oh, again, but you know, yeah. And, and that comes with all the, you know, bus breaks down, truck breaks down. I mean, you, you've been in bands that have been in little vans. You've been in bands that are in, you know, big tour buses and everybody oh, that's yeah. ever been on tour. We've all experienced those pains. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a, it's just part of the the life of being on the road. But as far as Joey goes, um, there's bands like Iron Maiden who are still out there touring and, and you're not anywhere near in 20 years. And you're not going to be this old, but they're like, I think they're like 77 years old, right? They go out on tour still flying themselves around the world. Yeah. Yeah. In in your own personal life and with what the things that you're doing, where do you see yourself in like five, 10, 20 years? You know, I'm very lucky. So with, with the used, um, you know, our, our band has no intention of stopping doing what we're doing. And that's a constant conversation that we have. Um, and we say it on stage quite a bit to keep ourselves accountable, but, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure we're going to be touring until, until no one will have us anymore. You know, like 
we're already, I mean, we're already feeling that a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest guy in the band, but the rest of the guys are in their forties and uh, you know, our bodies hurt a little bit more after a show and certain things, but um, the, it's just an unmatched experience. Like there is nothing else that I've ever found in my life. Um, you know, in my twenties, I did a lot of experimenting with different things and try different things on the road. And there was just nothing that can compare to, going on stage and playing a show for a sold out crowd that wants to sing the lyrics you wrote in your bedroom with your boys, you know, like it's, it's just an insane experience and it's an insane um, blessing to even get to do that. So uh, we don't take that for granted. And we've watched a lot of our friends forget about that and, and break up or, or go away or lose members or do certain things that like kind of muddy the waters. Um, I think with the used we're, we all get along so well and we all see the bigger picture in front of all the bad things that happen. So we're going to keep making records. Hopefully every other year we'll keep putting an album out. And if people want to come see us, we're going to stay on the road, you know? And, and weirdly enough, the band has been growing the last four or five years. Um, you know, we went from doing little clubs and house of blueses and, and kind of like on the downside of the band's career to now, you know, most of the shows that we're doing, we're playing amphitheaters and, and selling them out and playing later at the festivals and headlining stages. And um, that's been really fun for me since I'm a newer member is there's been a lot of checkpoints for the band that my guys have never experienced that we're getting to experience for the first time together. Um, but yeah, we're not going to stop, man. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go hard and get blood transfusions like the stones, but we're not there yet. So we'll see, you know, but uh but that that's, you know, that's the main side of things. But as far as the rest of my life goes, um, you know, producing is is a huge passion of mine and and the opportunities to work with bigger artists and, and younger up and coming artists have been getting bigger and better. And, and as the band's success grows, I get more of those opportunities. And that's really exciting to me, like getting to have a group of guys come into my space. We make something out of thin air that we all like. And then you go through the process of making art and getting it mastered and getting the label to prep it. And then months later, you put the song out with a video and then watching it slowly get popular and then play on the radio. And, and that whole life of a song that can come together in a couple hours, but watching it really provide years and years of, of a platform for an artist brings me so much joy. So I think that's something that I'm going to lean into a bit more you know, for the rest of my life, the studio keeps growing. And um, yeah, hopefully those opportunities don't go away. I don't piss off the wrong person and I'll keep doing it, you know? Right. Yeah. You, uh, you, you hit some, some fun points in there. Um, <laughs> the stones that they're, you know, they're, they're, I, they're even older than Iron Maiden. Um, I, they just, yeah, it was hard on stage, right? Iron Maiden. I, I they just put out a new song too. The know, stones right? just put out a new song what's her uh sydney sweeney's in the music video i'm like all right guys <laughs> all right guys don't it down yeah they're uh they're, i i can't believe they're still doing the stuff that they're doing i i i don't know how they're doing it um i love it yeah what's what's some advice you could give these guys um as they make the transition out of school into a professional career um that that you might have for them man um you know, a big thing, a big part of this, you know, obviously it's hard finding clients and finding work and finding really quality people that you like to you want to work with, right? Especially from an engineering specific standpoint. Um, I think, you know, finding producers that already have their foot in the door is a great place to pursue opportunities. Um, and I hate to say it, but a lot of times, you know, getting out and offering your time in exchange for those connections and those experiences is, is pretty important. Um, but again, like I, a lot of what I did when I got into producing and writing is I was reaching out, I was cold calling bands that I liked and that, Hey, I really like your stuff. You know, I have a space. I would love to work on something. Um, Co-writing was a big uh, door opening for producing as well you know, focusing on learning how to write great songs or at least guiding an artist to write great songs is the most important to get, you know, comeback customers rather than, okay, you have a song that you've already written and you've, you know, you did pre-production and you recorded it on your laptop already and I'm taking all your MIDI and just making it sound good. Like, that's cool. 
but as you guys already know, anyone can do that, you know, like having, having some skills outside of just the technical, I think is so important. And, and a lot of it comes down to being able to connect with freaking weirdos. Like artists are the strangest, craziest people that do not use logic and do not make sense most of the time, but they were born with that superpower to um, use their personal experiences to connect with other people. And, and that's something as a producer and an engineer, it's our job to really pull that out of someone and make them feel as comfortable and excited as possible to do that with us. So man, just really surrounding yourselves with, with people that are great writers, um, getting other people that you respect that are great songwriters that don't know how to engineer, you know, like attach yourself to those people. Like we call them top liners, um, you know, find guys that are great at writing a chorus or great at writing a lyric and stuff and, and have them come work with you with an artist you're producing or engineering or, um, you know, making songs on your own that you can show someone when they come in and say, hey, here's, you know, an idea we started. Does it sound like something you would want to work with? Um, but really just you got to you got to be over the top. You got to weasel your way into anything and everything. You know, like I've done anything from pop country to rap to gnarly metal to active rock um, indie, like you name any genre. And I've, I've you, know, you got to dive full in and f- figure out the best people that you can work with to make the most interesting and incredible music that's going to connect with people. But there's tons and tons of people out there that are so talented that have no clue about engineering, no clue about producing. They don't know how to get to the finish line. And I think that's the superpower that, that you guys will all have is finding those creatives that are so stubborn. They don't want to learn how to, you know, make one decent signal path for a good vocal or whatever and work with those people, you know, and um, eventually you can start charging whatever makes sense and, and taking care of the family. But without those things, without good songwriters and, and um, good musicians and people that are hyper creative, like all this stuff that we do from an engineering perspective and a sonic perspective, it really just doesn't matter. Like you have to have really, really creative, talented people in order to um, give worth to all the skills that you have. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I can think back to um, early, like early 2010s uh, bands that you worked with around here um, that maybe people didn't even associate you with. And I know that my students probably wouldn't know who they are because they don't exist anymore. But I, <laughs> the songs that stands out in my mind, like that, I didn't know this until this year that you and Jordan actually like worked on it was the Neverland song from Van Lady Love. Uh, oh sure yeah yeah, like uh um that song was recorded up at the castle recording studio in linden utah and i used to manage uh be the chief engineer up at that studio and went in on the sessions and like there's so many things that we've crossed paths so many times um Mm -hmm. from from the band i managed opening up for seosin back in uh taste of chaos to and the used um to the different studios around here uh, a couple of them don't exist anymore but you used a lot of my gear at audio west um and uh sure did thanks buddy <laughs> <laughs> made some money off that um but and, that, and you know but there's a uh, there's so many funny funny little ties um between joey and i and it's funny because ultimately it took you getting into hell or high water and then me reaching out to our mutual friend fred and saying, I want to talk to somebody in the band about the album that you just did, which was Vista, which is the tie back to your hometown and mm-hmm. talk about tone. And then we got connected in a video interview. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's, you'll send me video links of stuff that I've done in the past, like how I'm <laughs> watching you on YouTube. Um, That's right. But, yeah. We, but then you get all these little funny connections that go on and there's something about networking as well in this industry that I think you've highlighted, but haven't particularly highlighted. What are some of the, um, what are some of the industry ties that you've been able to leverage to help propel your career farther? If you can talk about those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's a a lot of different songwriters and, and people that I've met on my journey, you know, from even when I was selling merch, Uh, You know, I would never stay in my lane. And it's something that I encourage everyone to not do, 
Like, it's just, if you have the opportunity to be around people that you want to work with or respect or somehow have um, a helping hand that can get you where you want to go, like, I encourage everyone to cross the line. Like, there is, A, there's no rules in this industry. Like, someone may pretend that there is, and if they say that, then they are probably not really successful or have no clue what they're doing. Um, But for me, I mean, it was a lot of songwriters, uh, labels that I had worked with, A&R guys, you know, people that I really made sure to make a a good impression with and a lasting impression and be useful. You know, it's kind of some old world, like shit my dad taught me growing up, you know, but um, you know, always show up and be useful, you know, be on time and be useful. You know, if you, if you have something to help someone else's needle move forward, then eventually they're going to be willing to help you, you know? Um, but man, just uh, songwriters, people, labels, people in bands, people who are also trying to engineer and make stuff on the side, you know, especially with the age of the internet that we have in social media, like, you know, reaching out to people on even just Instagram is such an insane tool. Like there's producers that I've wanted to connect with and work with, and I'll just go on DM someone on Instagram. And before you know it, you connect with someone that you didn't think would even respond to you. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's entirely answering your question, but honestly, like there is no line that you can't cross, especially from what we're doing, songwriting and, and producing and engineering. There's always someone that needs you and they don't know that they need you yet until you go tell them that they need you. And that's a real, real world thing I had to learn um, by being told no a couple of times, you know, being in a situation where I did cross a line and they said no and whatever, but ultimately I still woke up the next day. I still work on music every day. And eventually those relationships do bear fruit and they do come back and say, Hey, that thing that we talked about, you know, I have this artist who needs something now. So um, I don't know if there's very like this person and this person helped me get to X, Y, and Z, but, but every one of the friends that I've made throughout the years and, and leaving a good taste in everyone's mouth that you work with is so, so important because this industry really is tiny, you know? Um, when I was selling t-shirts as a teenager on Warp Tour, you know, the kids that were also selling for other bands I made friends with, with no intention of, of using their resources or anything in the future. But as we got older and progressed in the industry, you know, person who was selling shirts for that band is now an A&R at a record label. And I could reach out to them and say, hey, as an artist I'm managing, you know, you should sign them to your label. It's like, oh, cool. You know, where previously you would email these labels, their contact at you know, universal.com and never hear from anyone, but your homie who you used to drink warm beers with is like now running the show. So he's into it. Like those are the relationships with anyone and everyone that you can make, um, be it from a local band that hasn't done anything yet, a promoter at a venue, uh, you know, a security guard. That's, that's a weird lesson that I learned too, you know, be kind to all these security guards and every single person you come across because eventually you're going to come back to that spot and they'll remember that the same way you'll remember if, if a musician or a promoter or a producer or someone was kind to you, like it makes you want to pull for them and it makes you really respect that the work that they do. So, you know, being good at Sonics and being good at all of the things that we find really important right now, as you're learning how to be engineers, those are prerequisites. You know, I always say that like talent and the ability to do these things, you better be good at that shit anyway. And then once you're past that, then you have to go out and make those relationships and, and, you know, just really leave a lasting impression on every single person you ever work with. Cause there's times, you know, someone calls me, Hey, we're looking for a drummer for this band that's going to go on tour. And whoever I've talked to most recently, who's a great hang and someone that I can get along with, who's their prerequisite is they're already good at drums. Yeah, here's the guy. Here's the person. You know, hey, we're looking for an engineer in Provo to help with this country project. It's like, cool, I have, I got a guy, you know. Um, it it really is relationships. I don't think that there's there's a proper answer to that question. There's not some guy, there's not like you gotta meet Ari Gold at whatever. It's like you gotta just be cool to fucking everyone. Excuse my French. All right. And those things bear fruit. I tell you what. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because you just gave some of the best advice that I think anybody in this industry can learn. And so to me, that's super cool, super great answer. Um, I'm going to turn the time over to my students for a little bit here. Cause I'm sure they got loads of questions. Yep. But hand already went up. 
So let me change the <laughs> here so that we can see the people who are talking. Chris, go ahead and ask a question. Fire away. Cool. Yeah, I had that ready. I had that unlock. No, <laughs> um, I, I'm, I've been having a hard time like trying to format. I have like three questions, and I don't want to take up everybody's time. Um, but really, the, the the kind of two things that they come from are one, you talked about having imposter syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. You still have that, and that's something that I've actually like heard a lot with you know listening to different interviews. But then on the flip side, you also um, did something that I kind of have been confused by a lot of interviews, specifically specifically with musicians. And so now I actually have to, I get to ask the musician a question <laughs> about this thing I'm always confused about. And I'm always confused when musicians say like, I never thought it would happen. I would, I was as a kid, I never, and like the reason I'm confused is because I'm like, wait, but you were doing it the whole time. Like, what do you, like everybody wants to get to where you are in, in some kind of sense. Like you said, it's like this dream. Sure. And, um, I have a funny thing I say that you either like everybody that didn't succeed, they gave up. There's people that yeah. succeed and there's people that gave up. There's no, and there's plenty of good excuses to give up. I'm not saying that everybody's like, it's not like negative necessarily, but that's kind of the simplified version of life, if you will. And so if we simplify it down that easy, like sure. But so you just never gave up. It's kind of like the ultimate simplified answer. But I guess my question really is a mix of those two things. One of like, do you did you really not ever think that it was going to happen like and you just love the music like what's the answer to that question like, yeah what? that's that's pretty close what you were just saying pretty much so like I'll, I'll take you back a little bit so when i you know when i was in high school and i started playing in bands with my friends and and started writing songs and doing things so that we could play in the quad at our high school and stuff you know it's something that i loved it was one of my favorite things but I also, you know, I grew up playing sports. I played baseball and football. And like, that was like, if you would have asked me when I was in maybe say ninth grade, where are you going to be in 10 years from now? I would have said, oh, I'm going to be in the minor leagues and eventually I'll be a professional baseball player. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, even though I was never, like, I never had that level of talent, but that was like my pipe dream. And music is something I do with my friends because they were my boys and we, yeah. it was fun and it was exciting and we could go make, you know, we could go record stuff in my garage on, on my little tape deck four track that I had. And um, I think a lot of getting into what you guys are doing, engineering and writing and doing all these things, it's just something we did to pass time. I never, I never set out when I got into playing guitar to be like, I'm going to be a famous musician someday. I'm going to like, you know, I think there was pipe dreams. I think there was like hints of like, it would be cool to do, you know, to be in a band and like to be in Blink-182 and travel the world and do all these things. But it was so unrealistic in my, I don't know, my, my pessimistic childhood that it was just like something I do. And then I think when my friends set off and, and started touring and started doing these things, joining other bands that were already established, I think that was really the first time that the thought crossed my mind. And my older brother did the same thing. He He's five years older than me. And when he graduated from high school, his band got signed to a little label and they went on a couple tours and, and I got to meet some bands that were, you know, bigger touring bands. And it was just kind of one of these things that I accidentally was opened up to. Um, and then once that happened, I kind of just, I kind of just didn't stop. It wasn't necessarily something where I was like, no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to go down this specific path and it's going to lead to, you know, this life that I want to have someday. It was, you know, my buddy called me and said, Hey, our merch guy's got to leave the tour. You want to come sell shirts and go on? We're in a tour bus, man. I was like, fuck yeah, dude, let's go. That sounds dope. Are you going to pay my rent? And they're like, yeah, we'll give you 200 bucks a week. You know, it's like, oh, sure. That's enough. And then I did that and met some other people and, and went home and, you know, played guitar with my friends and then got another call to come work for a band. And then I was like, well, man, I feel like I can do what these guys are doing. And then, you know, kind of start to make it a little bit more legit, get some better players, people that want to maybe try to book some shows out of our state and okay, let's get a van and let's see if someone cares. And then a tiny record label approached us and Hey, we're going to pay for your recording. And it really, really just snowballed. Um, but that's, that's not to say that I didn't, 
work hard and pursue those things. But I just think like, to me, when I was, when I was in my late teens and really getting heavy into touring, working for other people, I think that was when I started to have bigger dreams where it's like, man, it, it's crazy that there's bands that exist that get to bring their, their wife and kids on tour. They get to have a family, which is something that I, I think I want to have someday. And they still get to play music and travel and do those things. That would be crazy, but yeah. that'll never happen to me. You know, that happens to these other bands and whatever. Um, but man, it just kept kind of just kept happening. Like the more I was out there and the more I put myself in a situation where I'm around a bunch of people that do this for a living, other opportunities would present themselves in which I would just overcommit always. Like everyone that I ever filled in for, I was, you know, hey, can you do this? Oh, yeah, of course. And then they would leave and I would have a stress attack going, holy shit, I don't know how to learn, you know, 20 thrice songs in two days to play guitar with them. And like, I don't know what I'm doing, but you just you just do it, you know. And um, but I will say it's funny because a lot of the people that I'm around at this level now, you know, we tour with a lot of big bands. We're playing these huge shows. It's pretty much the same for everyone. And, and you know, we don't talk about it too often, but when we're sitting around in our lawn chairs after the show, you know, drinking non-alcoholic beers and, and talking about our lives, you know, it's everyone feels the same way. Like uh, we just did a tour with uh, Pierce the Veil a few months back and they were just going to number one on alternative radio. And we, our whole tour was sold out. Most of the shows were 15,000 cap amphitheaters. And we're all sitting around just going like, what the hell? Like, when is someone going to tell these people that we're just a bunch of idiots jamming with our friends, you know, but it just happens. And, and that being said, I will say my singer, Bert, he he's hilarious. He's the exception to the rule. He does this thing sometimes on stage where he goes, you know, if you would have told me when I was 12 years old that someday I would be playing sold out shows around the world and and doing all this stuff and living my dreams, I would have told you, of course I am. Like he, he's always had this overwhelming confidence. And he, since he was a little kid has always known like, this is what I'm going to do. And this is the only thing I'm ever going to do. Wow. And I couldn't be further from that. I could like every day I get to go play a concert and, and play a sold out room and, you know, go do a meet and greet and sign autographs and take pictures. I'm always just like, you know, are you sure? <laughs> like I'm just Joey, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I think I think what you said about not giving up is huge. And my dad actually said some powerful shit to me when I was like 20 years old. Uh, he was watching, it was called, I think it was called Fuse at the time. And it was all live music. It was like live festivals that they had filmed. And uh, there's some band that I had never heard of playing some silly alt song for 50,000 people. And I walked in and my dad was like, you know, the only difference that I I see from a band like this and what you're doing is that they've just been doing it longer. And eventually, you know, if you get the right song and you guys can all get along and, and you treat people right, then eventually you'll get the same opportunities that these other bands get, you know? And he was absolutely right. You know, I kind of just never stopped. And now I, you know, I, I run a pretty big business with a lot of artists that I get to help out. And, you know, I get to support my family by playing music and um, but it hasn't worn off. And then I, I don't think it'll ever wear off the imposter syndrome of like, how did I get this lucky? You know, that makes sense. Cool. Thank you. That's an answer. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> right. Kyle's got a question. Go for it. Yeah. So something that's, uh, you mentioned, you know, show up, be useful. And that's something that's driven home in our degree constantly show up early, be useful the whole time. And I'm just wondering, like, when you're working with engineers, whether it be recording engineers, mixing engineers, mastering engineers, um, what stands out? Like, what are some specifics that stand out to you where it's like, wow, this is, I'm going to call this person back. They did this thing. I'm going to call them back next time. Yeah. Um, for me, it, it really comes down to um, speed is a lot, has a lot to do with it. Like workflow. I'm very, very quick. I'm very type A. You know, if I have a song, say I'm holding an acoustic guitar and we're working on a song for an artist or, or for my band or whatever it is, I want an engineer to be able to take that as fast as possible and get that onto the computer before that idea is gone. So um, and that's something that I do as well. You know, when I'm working with an artist, even if it's we're not recording anything yet, we're just writing like be it doing a voice memo or, or whatever I can do to preserve the greatness of the idea and then hauling ass onto the session. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times 
before we go and we're like, okay, we have this song now, let's go set up the mics on the drum kit, get tones before we start tracking drums. No, let's pull up a good sounding MIDI drum kit and let's map out the whole song and build it as quick as we can. Let's just plug a guitar DI with a decent sounding amp that's already pulled up. Let's get it done as quick as possible so that we can get to the vocals. Like that is always, that was a big lesson I learned is the fastest you can get to recording the vocals, the better. And as soon as the vocals are done and make sense, even if it's just a chorus, right? Like, hey, we wrote this chorus, that's great. Um, okay, give me five minutes and I'll put a piano down for the, the chords we wanna use. And if we need drums, I'll do some fake drums really quick and then get the mic fired up, get in there and let's track the vocals. Once the vocals are done, then you can take a deep breath, go back and say, okay, how do we make this sound great? You know, um, but for me, that's huge. Like when I work with an engineer that that is slow, that can't get me, you know, the vibe quick enough, it, it can really kill a session. And, you know, there's some other engineer that is fast that can get you there. And, and those are the people that I tend to like to work with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you got to really be be able to, read the room so to speak you know when you have an artist come in you got to say okay this person's going to want this type of sound on the drums and guitar and piano and whatever if i can just build this as fast as possible uh that's huge in the sense of getting people to want to come back and work with you you know like a lot of times i'll book an artist will say hey i want to book three or four days to come to a single and i'm like that's way too long but okay you know and we will write and produce and finish an entire song from scratch by the end of the day you know, and if, if you can't do that, it's not to say that the song isn't good enough, but sometimes it is to say that the song isn't good enough. You know, if you have to fight to make something sound good, to me anyway, I never hold on to anything. So if it's too much of an issue to make something a great song, I'll throw it away and start over, do something different. Uh, but fast, man, like when I when I do stuff. You know, when you're sitting at home and you're messing with stuff and you're learning how to EQ this and you have a new plug in and you're like, all right, this drum program sounds good and this fake guitar shit sounds good. And I have this MIDI bass and this piano like, you know, making templates sometimes is great, but just the ability to say, OK, we have we have a song. I'm going to open up this drum program, get my four on the floor real quick. I'm going to put a pad on it so we have something to sing on. We want a guitar. OK, DI, let's go. Maybe spend one minute making it sound decent. And just just go fast. That is probably the most important thing to me. Um, and then past that, obviously, you know, being able to take an artist saying like, I don't know, I just wanted to like feel better and knowing how to just like bullshit those answers. And there's like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, maybe you mean reverb and delay and some more compression on this thing. And how's this sound? Does it feel better? It's like, yeah, that's it. Like. Um, I don't know. I just want like a vibe on the chorus. It's like, okay, well, here's a synth that we haven't used yet. Is this it? You know, like being able to just throw shit at the wall and be creative and use different things as fast as you can, I think is, is crucial. And there's little things that you can learn how to do that blow artists' minds that aren't engineers, you know, adding impacts and little hits and textures and things that you're making things pan left and right and, things that just get people excited to hear their song, you know, that that's, that's fun. I love to work with engineers like that. Um, there's a kid named Dylan McLean who engineers for John Feldman. Um, and he's one of my favorites because he he'll get you psyched up. Like every time I do a take on something, he's like, dang, that was dope. Like, what if you tried, let's get this pedal, let's try this cool thing. And it's like, okay, dude. Yeah. Like, you know, really getting an artist excited, gassing up an artist is great, dude. Like, if I'm working with someone that's struggling and can't get apart, like I'll gas them up. Like there's no one better than you in the room. There's no one else is going to come do this for you, dude. Like this is it, you know? Um, yeah. Speed and creativity. You know, if you can provide those extra layers that someone maybe doesn't have in their arsenal, then they're going to want to come back and work with, you, you know? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Will, let's get your question. All right. Hi, Joey. Nice to meet you. Um, hey buddy. I appreciate how like open you've been, you know, willing to be a little bit personal. So I think uh, I kind of wanted to ask about um, just your opinion on good lifestyle decisions and sort of mental health tips for everybody who wants to go kind of maybe approach uh, the industry like you have or get in there. Um, I think Brian at the beginning of the semester was super awesome. He said, you know, we always talk about business, but we don't always hear about, you know, 
what else is important in life in school and from you know people we look up to like brian and you yourself um other things like that so if you wanted to talk about like maybe a hardship you overcame or just general mental health and lifestyle tips i'd really appreciate that yeah yeah i think um you know, being as open as you can all the time, even with the people you're working with, uh, you know, your family, your friends, like just being transparent for me is, has helped me immensely. Like you know, there's times it's working on records, you know, where you start to get burnt out or you start to get just like, you kind of lose purpose. You lose the reason why you're doing certain things. I think talking about that is huge, you know, and, um, surrounding yourself with other people like we're talking about having cool co-writers and musicians and all these people you should have like a group of people that you can connect with you know that's more than just talent it should also be someone that you can connect with on that level and and be able to talk about things openly you know that's a huge thing for me working with artists um especially with within the genre that i do the most you know we're a lot of the songs we're writing are touching on mental health and are are touching on like big heavy you know kind of taboo topics but being open and transparent and and sharing those things and not bottling stuff up that's huge that's huge for us to be able to find success in an industry where we're literally putting our 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 experiences with really dark things out for the world to hear and to connect with and to judge us on it's kind of scary um but it's important that you just are willing to, to open up and willing to talk to people about those things. You know, there's times where I'll get burnt out trying to finish a record and what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? Who cares? What is the point of this? You know, but you talk with other people that are in the same situation like you are. And, and you have to realize that once you're done, like that's that feeling that we're searching for. We finished this insane task that maybe we didn't want to, or we didn't love as much as the last one, or isn't going to make us the money we had hoped for or whatever. But you have to realize that we have such a unique opportunity to create music. And that's something that lives forever. So I think that that helps me a lot is, you know, even when I'm burnt out, or I'm, I don't want to go to work, quote, unquote, like, I have to realize that every single day that I get to go make music, is something that will live on for eternity. And there's not really anything else that I can do in my life on this earth in this short moment of a speck of eternity that we're here that can make that big of an impact. And I really have to, uh, you know, you have to be able to to bring yourself back to that um, and try to focus on how cool of an opportunity it is. But yeah, do I, do I get, you know, bouts of depression and anxiety and all these things? Absolutely. And I have, moments all the time where I'm working on a record and I feel like I have no business being a part of this project or I don't think I can get to the finish line or any of these things but you have to have great people around you that can relate you know like it's not this is it's a really isolated job at times which is why I think having a community of people that do the same thing is so so important and talking about it and listening to other bands that talk about it and realizing that we're not in it on our own you know what i mean a lot of people are going through the same bullshit that is affecting our day to day but we get through it and then our music and everything that we get to do it really does live on forever you know awesome thanks for that answer um ethan Thank let's you. go Appreciate ahead and it. over uh to you uh yeah i just i wanted to ask you some questions uh, I actually, aside from school and everything, I actually play with a few bands and been trying to get stuff going. And I, I mean, I just I've loved listening to all of this. And uh, I guess one of my big questions and something I really admire and respect is that you're saying that you really pay attention to like kind of getting your getting out of the head of like, I'm a guitarist. I want my I want to leave my mark for my playing and making sure that like you're contributing most to the melody and to the song as a whole. And that's been something I've been trying to get into is like, how do you highlight the the melody or the vocalist? And I guess I just wanted to hear from you, what are some tips this can go for both as a guitarist? How do you kind of complement it? And what do you try to look for when you're creating a part in that way? And that can also be said for um, mixing and stuff. And how do you bring mm -hmm. out? the? Yeah, it's yeah it, it, it really becomes, um, you know, it becomes a battle of being able to be selfless. You know, when we're growing up and we're learning how to play an instrument, right? It's like we look up to guys that are 
insane at the instrument or have cool parts and songs and stuff. But especially in the modern world that we live in with, with how much music is out there and how saturated, you know, kind of the market is, I had to learn that having a cool guitar part or like having the ability to shred and things like that, they ultimately, they don't really bear fruit compared to having vocals that you can connect to and that are super easy. And, um, you know, I touched on John Feldman a little bit um, because I've learned so many lessons from him, but he, he told me, I think the first day I was making my first record with him, he wasn't trying to be a dick, but he was like feeling me out. And he was like, Hey man, I just want to let you know, I don't give a shit what the guitar does on any of the songs we do. I do not care. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like that's new, you know, (laughs) but you start to realize like, Hey man, this cool riff that I've had that I want to make work in something. It doesn't matter. It's so less cool than these three bar chords that I was humble enough to stick to so that the song is a hundred percent more catchy and I would so much rather have that than have the pride of this cool guitar part on a song that no one's ever going to hear, you know? And and that was a that took a lot of years of me trying to write the best guitar part to make a popular song and then learning that that really, you know, there's only like six bands where the guitar player is the reason you're going to listen to them, you know? And and they already exist. Like um for me I I I fortunately I've always been a songwriter first and I've been a self-loving guitar player second anyway so it wasn't as hard of a lesson to learn but but really learning that the less you can do on any of your instruments like some of the biggest songs in the world have a four on the floor loop the whole time the bass player is following the rhythm and the guitar player is playing power chords like um, I think I said it earlier, but if you can't play a song on with one acoustic guitar or one piano, then the song maybe isn't a hit, you know, regardless of genre. Like, and that that really opens up the ability to write better songs. And then once you have once you have the vocals and the melody and you have that bass line, then go ham. Then you get the opportunity to build a riff or a part that weaves in and out with the vocals and complements what the vocals are doing rather than, Hey, this guitar part works really cool over this, this, you know, synth in the chorus, but ultimately it's going to clash with what the vocals are doing. Like we don't want to change the vocals. So the guitar has got to change. Someone's got to suck it up and like be willing and, and humble enough to say, okay, it's not about me. You know, the best musicians that I've ever been able to write music with are, you know, uh, this guy, Kyle Rosa is a drummer. He plays drums for a tray. You now, actually, he's probably the best drummer I've ever worked with in my life. And one of the reasons is he's willing to, to do four on the floor when it's important, you know, and if he has to, if we force him to, he can do some crazy shit that sounds fun and insane. And it's cool for other drummers to watch for a minute, but that's not going to make the song, you know, like there's really something there's a superpower to people that aren't that good at their instrument and they're able to write great songs like Kurt Cobain. He's like the worst guitar player ever. And that being said, he has some of the coolest guitar parts of all time because he doesn't give a shit if it's technically correct or if it's some fancy part, he's just playing guitar that he can sing to. And by proxy, it ends up being the coolest vibe that we've heard, you know? So Joey, speak just on Kurt Cobain I read a an article the other day that said that smells like teen spirit is the most impactful song of all time right I fully agree we play that in our set yeah I and mean, you play it right yeah I played it last night it was nuts <laughs> it's so crazy because that's for you guys that's the first song I learned how to play on the guitar that's how easy that guitar part is but it's so impactful. So I'm, I'm, that's cool that you brought that up because it, it's easy, but it's hard. It's funny yeah. you say that too. Cause we, we have a song um, from a couple records ago called uh, uh, paradise lost paradise lost a poem by John Milton is the name of the song. And the whole intro of the song is like this Nirvana, like shitty strat guitar, you know, and we're sitting in the studio and I play the part and Feldman's like, no, 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 do it shittier. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like trying to jangle it up, trying to play it shitty. And I like, I legitimately could not play it shitty enough because I've practiced guitar for too long. So I gave the guitar to Bert who like kind of knows how to play. I'm like, here's the chords, dude. And he played it and it was like, yes, that's it. Like sometimes you need a guy in the room 
who whose fingers don't know what they're doing to to capture that vibe and to really make a song special. And I do that with Brandon Seller all the time. There were so many songs that we wrote that it was just like, dude, I don't, this is the weirdest issue I've ever run into, but I can't play it shitty enough to sound the way we want it to sound. And you give it to someone that doesn't know what they're doing, who's playing with one finger and whatever. And it's like, yes, that is what I'm going for. So it's just like, these were smoke screens that, that I didn't realize existed until later on when you're like, man, why is Kurt Cobain like his the, his style is just stuck in my head because he didn't sit in his room all day playing guitar he sat in his room all day writing poetry and writing lyrics and figuring out advanced ways to explain the way he felt and that is so much more important than being technically savvy at anything it really is yeah that's awesome was your first album with uh feldman Heartwork? yeah yeah mm-hmm. okay and and before that um you worked with Fred. Um, I did a few records with Fred. Um, what other producers did I work with? Oh, man. I'm like seeing faces of guys that can't even remember their names. I worked with a bunch of people throughout the years. I also, I did, you know, a lot of producing of, of my band stuff myself. And we would just bring in other people to help co-write and do certain things. But um, that was a huge lesson, too, just to put that out there. I know I've said the word a few times, but, um, you know, learning that, most like big songs and big hit records and stuff it's not the three guys in the room that are just like magicians at writing a bunch of hit songs it's the three guys in the room and a producer and the producer's friend who's great at writing choruses and this other person who is great at melodies and you bring them in and the ability to work with as many people as you can to create something that's a great song that is a superpower. And that's something I didn't know was how you get to that point for a long time. The more people you can bring in to help you write a song, the better. And I don't mean, you know, person who has some deal and is some famous songwriter. I mean, anyone that you respect from a creative and an artistic perspective, that's going to be in the room and provide even a vibe is going to get you something cooler than you would have done on your own. Like I, I have a couple of friends at home that are not even musicians, they're not songwriters, but they're just creative people. And sometimes if I'm hitting a wall, I'll have them come sit in my room on their computer doing their work and bounce ideas off them. What do you think of this? Oh, I, don't, I like the last thing you did. All right, cool, that's what we're gonna do, you know? And, oh, what if you did this thing? Like just anyone who's creative that you respect is absolutely worth having in the room when you're trying to make a song that's great and gonna connect with the most amount of people. Awesome. We got any more questions? If not, we can cut it free, but it's, you know, I'm going to make a reference to a song off of it, Vista. It's been another good time with Joey. And, <laughs> you know, I, I love that album. I still jam out to that one all the time. And every time I walk outside and it's raining, I, I text Jordan, I'm going for a Joey. And he, because <laughs> it's a walk out in the rain. So oh, that's you know, great. That album, that one just, if you guys haven't listened to it, go check it out. I know there's a lot of, you know, you got everybody's heard of the U's, especially because we're in Orem, Utah, and that's where they originated out of. From, so. <laughs> hometown heroes. <laughs> yeah, hometown heroes. Um, thanks so much for spending the time with us. It's it's been a pleasure. Um, stay in touch, and uh, I should get your new album just like I got this one up here. I should get your new album signed and put it up there so that we can represent hometown heroes here in my home yeah i think i have Joey. we have a uh we have a day off in salt lake on this run here in a couple of weeks so i'll get you a vinyl I'll get it all signed up for the wall cool i'll uh i'll let me know what that day is and i'll i'll come out and hang out so yeah i love I'm it we're gonna bring you down here to the studio if you got time you could come check out i'd be i'd be super down let's talk about it i'll come meet all you guys okay we'll uh we'll get it uh scheduled up um thanks again joey it's been again a pleasure and uh for all you guys in class, thanks for tuning in, watching, and um, we will do it again soon. Thanks, Joey. Yeah. Be good and prosper, y'all. Yes.